Good morning and welcome to a live talk program. This is Lloyd Grubb here, your host on Revive Reform Radio, doing our live talk program covering current events on this year, Thursday morning, rise and shine and give God the glory. And this morning here, we're looking at a topic, who is troubling the nation and the church? So who is troubling the nation and the church? This is what we're looking at here. So welcome again, hopefully at a blessed night rest, top of morning to you and hopefully we'll, um, you'll have a productive day. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of today, for life, and for your word. Thank you for the guidance that you give us, that we shall know how to navigate in this world. May you bless us, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. So, who is troubling the nation and the church? Who is troubling the nation and the church? Is our topic of focus here um, as we look at current events. And again, I'm continuing from the thought about um, this idea here about who's troubling nation with Jeroboam and all that and um, continue this thought about it's important for you to know what's going on so you can make the right decision and know where you lay your head and where you rest where your fate has found a resting place so notice here um, this idea who is troubling the nation so we see currently and I'm going to be going back to the story of Israel to review this but we see currently that there's trouble in the nation and so the question is who is doing it who is the cause and as you say who is to be blamed for causing trouble in the nation or the church so you see problems in the church you see problems in the nation and they're the same problems the right or conservative conservative conservatives blames on the the left and the left blame the right so both sides um, are correct. So I believe both sides are correct. So if you listen to the arguments that the right put forward, um, you would think those, for the most part, those are correct. And the arguments the left put forward, I believe those are correct. And so that might be different um, for you to hear that, that both sides are correct. They're both blaming. And then you look at the, all the plethora of problems going on. You you if you If you're neutral to it or you're you're reasonable, you could see real easily like, yeah, that's part of the problem. Mm -hmm. This is what's causing trouble in the nation. And if you listen to the other side, you'd be like, yeah, that's causing a problem and that's trouble in the nation. And, and ultimately, both will get together and blame the righteous. So when they realize that both of them are right and that they, they never was addressing the, the real problems, which is what both of them are recognizing, but they're saying those are the only problems, then the problem will be out of control at a certain point because nobody's really addressing it. They're just blaming, passing the, the buck. So we're going to pick up this thought here because this is part of the issues that are going on. These are broader issues that are going on in the church, as I say, in the nation. And both are looking at it. If you're in the church, there's a conservative wing in the church and a liberal wing. Uh, in Israel and throughout history, the, the liberal wing is always the larger wing. The conservative wing is always the stronger wing. Wind, wing, sorry. So there, there, there are these both sides that are in all countries and all government. It's just how we are. Somehow, I guess we are born and we flip to one or the other. I don't know how that happens, but we either go conservative or liberal. Um, and both wings are blaming each other. But both wings are part of the problem. You know, you you think about the national death, uh, the national debt. Sorry, and. You think about the amount of money the country owes and you could quickly realize that both wings of the party and the society these, these party wings are natural wings so to speak uh it all countries had it throughout history um they both are causing the national debt but if you'd said to the conservatives who's causing it they'll say it's a liberal you say the liberal who's calling it a conservative conservative uh you look at a big part of the national debt is the war war machine um so and both sides are causing it and then there's other issues but the reality is that a lot of what's going on is just we all have to deal with it and you see as i go through this presentation that it's part of the reality like a big part of national debt is the health care problem well both sides of people that are sick because that's part of sin so it's just part of the reality you know so you, it's just Blaming without taking responsibility is not a good thing. And then you go into the church, you see some of the results in the church where they're closing churches. P 
people are leaving the churches in all denominations and people are going to secularism and atheism and all these things. And you say, who to be blamed? And the liberals will say, well, it's the conservatives that are the problem. And the conservative will say, no, the liberals are the problem. They're causing the problem. And then ultimately, both of them will get together and say, it's the independent is causing the problem because they keep talking. They keep talking about our problems. <laughs> and, you know, but the problem is, is sin is causing the problem. And we will look at that right now. So in 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29 through 33, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29 through 33. Notice here, um, it says, And in the third and the thirty and eight year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab, the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty and two years. So, twenty and two years. Very eventful 22 years so he took over from his father Amri and he reigned and this is one of the more um, crazy reign of Israel this is when Israel was in deep apostasy and so as I say people like to say oh the church is God's church and it's Israel it's, it's spiritual Israel but they don't want to talk about well Israel has a very unique experience when they come on to rebellion and crazy, crazy leaders. And they don't want to talk about that part. They just want to talk about the fact, the good part, which I don't know if you read the Bible, most of it is bad parts. <laughs> so it's weird. Um, and verse 30, And Ahab, some of Unri, Amri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. So in this time when Ahab was leading, who was to be blamed? For who caused trouble causing the trouble in the nation. You see, this is this is where the discussion comes. Because if you talk to conservative, they'll say, well, you know, it's the abortions and the, the immigrants because they're coming to take what we have. They, they're coming to, to get social services. And if you talk to liberals, they'll say it's the war machine and, you know, the wickedness that is going on in the prison industrial complex and, you know, all that stuff they'll point to. And that's why I say, well, both are to be blamed but ultimately who's to be blamed is the leadership because they have the control in their hands they're making the rules they're structuring or creating the country they want to so notice here the bible and it says the local people in the pews and what i've learned over the years uh, as paul says is that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood but against spiritual wickedness in high places the local people wasn't to be blamed it's not local people in the church are in the citizenry, so to speak, it's the leadership. They're the one that's leading the country into wickedness. You know, somebody will say, oh, no, it's the advisors. Why our countries uh, separating families at the border, which is a wicked evil that always happened to evil empires. Um, it's, the, it's, it's the border patrol agents. No, it's not them. I mean, they're doing the job and they're partly to be blamed. But the most, most of the blame fall on the leadership, the president. The, the Congress, the Senators, they're the one that's doing this wickedness. So we understand who is troubling the nation, who is cursing the nation. you got to understand the way the Bible sees it and God sees it. God doesn't see it the way man sees it. You know, I, I use an example when the 2008 financial crash happened. A lot of the media and the people blame the poor people who were losing their homes. They didn't blame the Wall Street brokers and financial houses. Um, some did, but the majority seemed blame poor people. And then most of those poor people were black people who were already financially struggling. And they blame the poor people in the communities that were, you know, were needed help. And they said, they're the one that caused the crash. And I'm like, man, what a wicked society we live in. So you don't blame the poor people. You blame the leaders. In the Bible, God don't, God doesn't say that the people are excused, but the main trouble is a leader the people get punished for the leader's decision but god says look notice he says i read it again and ahab the son of amri did evil in the sight of the lord above all that were before him verse 31 says and it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of jeroboam the son of nebat that he took to wife jezebel the daughter of etbeal king of the zidonians and went and served Baal and worshipped him. 
So you see this happening. You see even people claiming to be pastors in the church, married to like movie stars and stuff like that. You'd be like, man, it's like you're taking on Jezebel as your wife. Why can't come good of this? So it came to pass, right? Again, it, as if it was a light thing. So Ahab, like, look, Jeroboam is bad. God cut off his, 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 we're skipping a few chapters now. But God cut off his, his, his family and cursed the whole family because of his sin. His sin was so grievous that even the unborn had to die. So this was Jeroboam, Jeroboam's sin. So notice here, we don't like to talk about that in the church or in the country, that sometimes we have some wicked leaders that curse the country and cause curse to come up in the people. But this is how, how it works. This is why we read the Bible, so we can have these insights and understand of what's really going on behind the veil, what we can't see because our eyes can pierce and see the spiritual wickedness in high places. But then we see the results and then we go back and study the Bible. The Bible tells you, you see these results, you know this is the cause. God doesn't like wicked. And here God points and says, look, Jeroboam did this. Sorry, Jeroboam did it in the past and Ahab outdid him. Now somebody could tell me, oh no, the problem why the nation is having trouble is because these people are coming to take free stuff from the social security system. Well, look, the Bible tells me it's wickedness. Right, so here, he outdid, and he didn't say, well, he didn't know better, and he had a bad upbringing. You see, God doesn't reason in that type of way. You know, he's an adult. A man is a grown man, and he decided to go wicked way, with, to the wickedness. Notice here, he did worse. And he did worse and served Baal and worshipped him. So he was a devil worshipper. Notice in verse 32, and he, and he reared up an altar for Baal. In the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. So he's just like, man, right in Israel, we're going to do devil worship. So I know it was a shock to many people who, again, they, when they say the Adventist church is spiritual Israel, they couldn't imagine this type of stuff going on there. But that's tell you that that's either the lack of imagination or lack of Bible study. If you understand devil worship is always a reoccurring theme with humanity. Somehow there's a point where people, I guess, get tired of serving an invisible God and they just go and they're still serving an invisible God. They just say, we're going to do devil worship. I don't, it's, it's still worship a God you can't see. But this time it's darkness. They just turn themselves over to darkness. So when they announced that there was spiritual formation going on in the church amongst the leaders, you would understand this is what happened. And remember, it's happening in all church, Catholic church, Baptist, Methodist. All the churches have been infiltrated or revert back to this old world worship, which is devil worship. The other thing also, if you understand Freemason and secret societies, all Freemasons type of religious orders are simply nothing but old world devil worship, Baal worship. Baal worship never stopped. If you don't understand what you know, these secret societies are, you simply go to the Bible, read about what's Baal worship. You read historically, go on Wikipedia, wherever. And when whatever you're reading, that's what Freemasons and those rites groups are. They're just devil worship, Baal worship, modernized. And that's why you never see those buildings with windows because they don't want everybody to know that inside of these buildings, what's going on is old world Baal worship. So this never stopped. It's just, and then here's the problem. You could have a Freemason who is a member of a church and you, you give it time. They will swing the church in that direction because they're doing it privately. They would want the whole church to do it publicly so that they can feel comfortable in the church. They're not into God worship, they're into devil worship. So he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made, grove, made a grove and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. So notice here, he provoke. And when you provoke God to anger, then there's going to be some results. Now you will see the results and then you'll say, well, where's that result coming from? Oh yeah, because the leaders are provoking God to anger. So that's why my topic is, who is troubling the nation and the church? So when bad things are happening in the church or in the nation, one has to pull back and say, who's doing it? And then people start to blame because people are starting saying, oh, no, it's not me. 
It's this person over here. So Jeroboam had led down Israel down a certain path. That's the ten northern tribe. And other, tri other kings came after him and did bad. But now Jeroboam, sorry, now, uh, what's his name? Ahab. It outdid Jeroboam in devil worship and rebellion. He's just like, outdid it. I remember, um, which is important, is that people normally say, but how do you know for sure that this is the cause of the trouble? Well, it's always going to be results-based. This is the difference between the religion that I believe in and I preach that was out there. Because when you study the Bible, you realize it's results-based. You, you, Christ says it this way. He said, by their fruit or fruits, you shall know them. Not by what they say. So if I'm preaching and you listen to me and then you get certain results and then somebody is preaching and you listen to them and get certain results, what makes it true or false, so, so to speak, is the results. Now, there might be other things you can test the Bible and all that, but everybody's going to say they're preaching from the Bible. So that's important to note. Everybody's going to say we preach the Bible and nothing but the Bible. And some people go as far as saying we preach only the King James Version. You know, I'm not saying that, but I'm just saying there's people who say that. So that means if they're preaching from the King James Version, it must be true. And people believe them. But if the results are rottenness and failure and disaster, then you got to go by the results. And so, wait a minute, the results are a mess. So probably this is a mess. So this is the difference in how we know who's troubling the nation because we have to look at the results. And results always speak for themselves. And this is different from saying, well, this person is speaking truth and that person is speaking truth. Remember I was talking about yesterday with what the difference between those who follow the prophet and those who don't. You look at the modern day preachers who believe that they don't believe in no spirit of prophecy. They don't believe in no health message, no, you know, practical godliness. They don't believe none of that. They just believe in grace. You look at the mess that's going on with the members. And then you can judge from that and say, well, if I believe this over here and I follow the prophets and the prophet and I get good results and I follow these simpletons with their theological degrees and I get a mess in my life, well, probably I need to follow whoever gave me the good results. Is results based. Remember, the Lord says in um, Hebrews chapter eleven, uh, verse six, He says, "I will." He says, "He reward those who diligently, who believe in Him and diligently follow Him." So, if you you get a reward and it's positive because you're diligent, and somebody say, "Ah, why are you being so serious about following Jesus?" And then you don't follow, you get a curse. Then you say, "Wait a minute, this is simple. There's not much intellect to do with this, and much reasoning even." I just do this, I get this result. This is what we preach and this is what I really believe. Because I really believe we go by not just the evidence presented to us even from the word, but we go by the results, by the fruit. Because I just say everybody's preaching, they say from the word. We believe in the Bible. But what's the result? In 1 Kings now, we move on a little bit with the story. Uh, who's troubling Israel in First Kings chapter seventeen verse one, and Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitant of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. So until immediately after that happened, they started a drought. Now until the word goes out from Elijah. The tish bite. No rain falls. Elijah just says, stop, no rain. Place is cursed. Now here's important because Elijah is the one that called for this. Now, um, I can't remember if where I've if I've read that he did it on his own accord. You know, he just said, Lord, this is what I want to do. I want to stop the rain. But it's important to note that in that statement, one could say he's the cause of the problem. But remember. What was going on in Israel was human sacrifice. They were sacrificing their children. There was all kind of criminality and vile wickedness that was going on, all kind of oppression. So the, the, he was not just calling it for it for no reason. This is not witchcraft. This is cause and effect. He's saying, you're cursing the, the country. We're going to have to bring this country to its knees. And that's really what happened. When sin breaks out and become out of control, then this is where trouble begins. So notice in verse, um, in 1 Kings again, chapter 18, now verse 17 and 18, move down a little bit. 
1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17 and 18. And it came to pass when Ahab saw Elijah, that Ahab said unto him, Art thou he that troubleth Israel? So that's a very important question. Uh, because one could say, yeah, the prophet troubled Israel. But one could say the prophet was trying to save Israel. Because what was going to happen? If Ahab had continued with this thing to continue to provoke the Lord, and my man here, my prophet here, Elijah, the Tishbite, knew that um, this is going to be the end result. It was going to be death, me and my destruction. Ahab look at it as he's troubling Israel. He doesn't, Elijah's troubling Israel. He doesn't look at it as he's troubling Israel with his devil worship. So this is where the problem is. And I've, I've talked to people and they're saying, well, you know, as I say, I was recently talking to somebody. You know, all of these things that don't come out of nowhere. I was talking to an elder of a church and he was saying to me that the problem is, you know, basically you guys, because you all are independent, you're not part of the corruption. You're not joining with us with our slugfest. But you see, that's simple, simplistic thinking and, you know, idiocy at, at its best. Because what the problem is, is, is that people are always strong to condemn the weak and beat up the weak. As I say, if you ask some people, it was the poor people taking on loans that they couldn't afford that caused them financial crash. It wasn't the borrowers lending money to people that can't pay it back that caused the financial crash. In other words, your doctor will blame you if your doctor miss diagnose or treat you wrongly he won't blame himself as a professional this is when people side with him because people are silly and you got to notice in this life because like people like to beat up and pile on on the poor and the defenseless but we're not bullies here so we defend the poor and defenseless because you see there what happened Ahab doing all this wickedness is Ahab leading out in the worship of these various different gods that are sacrificing kids and all that. Is he doing this, you know, this old world Baal worship where they sacrifice kids? You see, always see, you know, you go online, you can see all these kids missing every day. And you never find them. Their bodies never turn up. And and so you see this type of stuff and they'll say, oh no, what's troubling the country is these migrants coming over to work in farms. You know, this is the type of silliness. Or if somebody comes out and say, hey, the wickedness in the church need to stop. They say, oh, why, why why, publish that? Well, why not? You know, but they'll say, it's talking about it's causing the trouble. It's not the wickedness going on. It's causing the trouble. Oh, and you see that. It's the same type of thing. If you point out some evil in the nation, people say you're causing the trouble. Not the, the evil causing the trouble. You pointing it out and saying this is wickedness and it needs to stop. And this is causing the problem. So Ahab says, Are thou he that troubled Israel? And he answered, This is Elijah, I have not troubled Israel, but thou and thy father's house, in that ye have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and thou hast followed Baalin. Those going off the Baal worship. As you noted, and you've seen the increase in the amount of Eastern mystical religion, more paganism coming in, more paganism. It's not gonna be the country is gonna be blessed. It's gonna be worse because paganism come with its demoralizing and ruining results. The results again speaks for itself. It's like somebody say, "Oh yeah, but these Hindu gurus, they're so powerful." Well, look at India. How are they powerful? When they start, you know, having all those starving masses, then you can talk to me. But again, they'll say, "Oh yeah, but they teach." principles that are what what a bunch of confusion you try reading that stuff it's like uh, you gotta take that devil worship stuff and throw it in the garbage um and that's what i did i was curious one day i said give me that book i'm reading <laughs> and i'm like oh dear this is some madness um so notice here proverbs chapter 14 verse 34 so Proverbs chapter thirteen, Proverbs chapter fourteen, sorry, verse thirty-four. Now, when you look at what the answer was, Elijah basically gives the right answer. The trouble is not from the Lord; is not from Elijah. Elijah is responding just as how God would respond. Elijah understand what God is doing. You see, this is when you know you start to connect with the Lord, when you start to see and understand. Oh, I think I can see what's coming. If you hear the problem, you can see what's coming. Because you see you're tapping into the mind of God, how God works. Because God is trying to 
save lives, uh, but you will cause certain things to happen to push people back to like stop them. And that's all, you know, it's called like suppression fire, they call it in war. Not necessarily killing anybody, but you just want to make sure they don't come forward. Now, in Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34, Proverbs 13, verse 34, it says, Righteousness exalted a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. Sin is a rebuke. It's a, it's a condemnation. See, the condemnation on Ahab was his sin. It was the departing from the commandments of the Lord and from devil worship and for devil worship. This was the sin of the people. And the leaders have the choice. You can't talk to me about what's wrong in the nation per se. We can have a conversation, but it has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with the leadership. You could, you could, you could, I could even talk all day long about what's going on in the church. That's why I don't. I try to limit what I say um, for reasonable sake. For reason's sake. Why? Because, you know, I can only, I, I really don't affect it. I'm not making those decisions. You know, people always say, the Lord will fix the church. Well, I'm like, the Lord didn't mess it up. The Lord didn't go into board meetings of the board meetings and vote wickedness. The Lord didn't go into the theological seminaries and force the theologians to teach nonsense. So how how you say the Lord's gonna fix it? And if the Lord's gonna fix it, I'm gonna fix it the way you think. The Lord gonna fix it the way he always fixed it. How does he fix it? He rise up men of after his own heart to preach to the people. Notice the prophets always come in. You, you ever notice that? They're not they're not normally present when trouble hits. They normally are called or they come in by God, tell them, say, get up and go and go to my people. Because they're not there. They're not part of that. The prophets are not there. Now, I'm sure probably somebody could find one example in the Bible or two probably. I don't know. I never. I don't know it in my head. Okay, I see it where the prophet was present and partaking of the wickedness. Uh, the prophet normally sent two. That's what God does. But people, you know, they don't understand that. The prophet is sent to his people. They're not partaking in that. They're normally out in the hills or in a cave somewhere. And God said, get up and go. You know, like he said to Jonah, go to that wicked city, Nineveh, which was not Jewish, but it was Nineveh. He said, go there and tell them to repent. The prophet goes too. And then he goes back. Uh, we could spend a whole time on that, but we move on. First Kings chapter 12. 1 Kings chapter 12. Now we're going to reread this here again before we talk about some of the current events that are going on that has to do with who troubling the nation and the church. Notice in 1 Kings chapter 12, verse 28 through 33. It says here, Whereupon the king took counsel and made two calves of gold and said unto them, "Is It is too much for you to go to Jerusalem. Behold thy gods, O Israel, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt. So here we read again. I went back a few chapters. Uh, we were just in 16 or so, 18. Sorry, I went back to 12. And this is a story again of Jeroboam. So remember, Ahab did worse than Jeroboam. So if you wanted to reform, you have to go back to where Jeroboam made a mistake or a bad choice. Because some things in life, we don't always make mistakes. So I uh, this is a side note here. Be careful of always saying that you make a mistake. Sometimes we don't make mistakes. Sometimes we do. Sometimes we make a bad choice. We have two choices in front of us and we know what's the right choice and we do the wrong choice. And when we do this, as a side note here, you need to be big enough, a man enough to say, you know, I made a bad choice. I'm, I choose the wrong way. Don't say I made a mistake. That's not a mistake. I know what a mistake is and I know what a bad choice is. There's times when you know what you're doing and you do the wrong thing. And you're like, man, I shouldn't do that. That's a bad, that's not a mistake. That's that's a choice. You need to man up your choices and say, I'm sorry. Um, to man or to God. Anyhow, back to this. So here, um, we are for two counts, right? And he did these two casts of gold. So this is Jeroboam messing up Israel now. So if you want to reform the nation, the church. You have to go back and say, where did we make a wrong choice? Because often people will say, well, we need to go back. And you say, well, go back to what? Because we, we've tripped up somewhere along the way. You got to start where you trip up. And you have to know where you tripped up. Say, so if you don't know where you tripped up, 
how are you going to reform it? Because I've met people say they need to reform the church back to the 70s. Well, by then the church was in full-fledged rebellion. We, we, they were just waiting for someone like a Desmond Ford to come forward and just tr push the church over the, the cliff. It was already in rebellion, turn us back and move in the wrong direction. So where do you reform back to? That's a very big question to ask. And it's important for you to think about that on a personal level also. When you make a mistake, you also have to say, where did things go wrong? And suddenly you realize, you know where it went wrong? My parents. They taught me something and then I followed it. And so I have to repent of their sin also in my personal life. And then I move forward. You got to know where this went wrong. So the reformation that was needed, you see, remember when by the time Josiah came, come around. So the prophet came and said, Josiah. So all these prophets between Jeroboam and Josiah, all of that, any reform that happened was just Peter patter. It, it's just, you're joking. You need radical reforms, radical reforms in order for things to get back right. You need to destroy the, the groves, tear down the altars. And if you notice, if you read, if, 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 if I wasn't going to switch tomorrow, you read, I probably should do it tomorrow. Anyhow, you read, you was notice in the Bible, the, but God keep say, making a prophet write down that the sins of Jeroboam was not repented. See, until that sin was repented, Israel would have always been stuck because kings would come and they'll try to do the right thing, but they leave. This, this thing that Jeroboam did right here that I just read. And I'm going to read the rest of it in a second. They didn't touch it. So unless you touch that. So what it is is that say, if we say now, say if I come along and say, I understand what needs to happen. We need to do a thorough reform. People are like, no, that's crazy. How are we going to do that reform? We'd have to go back a hundred years and fix the problem from there. And I'd be like, yep, that's what needs to happen. You can't fix the church if you don't reform all the way back. So if, if I'm doing something and I'm doing it the way it's supposed to have been done a hundred years ago, somebody say, you know, that's radical. And I'll be like, yep, you're right. You got to be radical. And that's the same thing when it comes on to personal development. If you don't understand that, you can't just put some paint on stuff. You got to tear it down and rebuild it properly. Then you don't understand what reformation or revival and reformation is all about. You got to be have a radical change in your life. It can't be just an easy change. Somebody say, oh, you know, I want to lose 100 pounds. So what are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to start drinking uh, eight cups of water a day. Well, you're joking. Eight cups of water, what's that going to do? If you have 100 pounds extra on you, you need to be drinking like a gallon a day. And then you, you back down until you get to eight. You know what I'm saying? You start off, you know, or you build up to a gallon and then back down back to a gallon. Um, into eight cups. You first have to hydrate your system, overhydrate it, and then now slowly wean off that gallon and get back down to eight and then stay there. But if you've been dehydrated for years, drinking eight cups of water is it's gonna be it's gonna be revolutionary, so to speak, and better than what you were doing before. But you need to totally rehydrate, you need to be soaking in that stuff. In other words, I'm just saying in general, just in case somebody say I need to get up and drink a gallon. I've done it before. And it is refreshing <laughs> because, you know, you will, you will, you will increase your bladder strength. These are side notes again. <laughs> you increase your bladder strength. You will increase your, um, your ability to hold water, all that stuff. And you'll give yourself, your kidney liver, a good flush. Your colons will flow better. Your urinary tract will get a nice wash. And then you back down off that gallon and slowly wean yourself down to like eight cups a day. And when you go to eight, it would be like lifting weights. It would be like if you're lifting a 30-pound weight and then you go now to lift 10 pounds. 10 pounds is like nothing. The egg cups now become very reasonable, but you have to overshot it, so to speak. So you build up slowly and then build back down. Um, but anyway, side note. So if you notice there, this is, you got to have, the, in order to get change, you, you got to overdo it. You got to get zealous. You got to get... Whatever. So nothing happened because everybody keep on coming and they never went back and said, where, where, when did Israel Israel went wrong? And somebody said, well, yeah, Jeroboam. What did he do? Jeroboam did these things. Okay, we have to undo that. But somebody said that would unravel the system. Well, we got to unravel the system. 
because the system is built upon falsehood. We built up a machinery that shouldn't be there in the first place. So the, it's that we have to collapse the system. But people said nobody's going to have the, the guts to do that. Well, that's the problem. That's why when you read, again, Ellen G. White's notes, she says that storm and tempest will sweep away the structure because the structure is built upon sand. So the structure shouldn't have been there in the first place, so the structure has to go. And when the structure goes, then you can move forward. But we're stuck because we're stuck in basically keeping a system that wasn't supposed to be there in the first place going. And we're trying to see what we can put, you know, martyr, tempered martyr on it. And it's not working. You're patching nonsense. It's not working. The whole thing has to go. Every, everything. Just scramble the whole thing and you reset it. And who is strong enough to do that? Most people are not. So notice here, and he said, the one in Bethel and the other in Dan. So he's building up a structure and a system that as modern LNGY calls it in intellectual philosophy. If you if you lose, listen to all these pastors preaching, they're all intellectual philosophers. They're not Bible preachers. They're not similar to old gospel preaching preachers or the prophets of whole, old they're intellectual philosophers. You think about the probably number one intellectual philosopher in the country would be Joel Austin. These are intellectual philosophy. It ain't nothing to do with God and Bible. They're not going to tell you to repent uh, because the kingdom will join near. Because it's intellectual philosophy. It's just sweet talk, basically. Smooth things. Notice here, and in this thing, and and this thing became a sin for the people when to worship before the one even unto Dan. And he made an house of, on, of high places and made priests of the lowest of the people, which were not of the sons of Levi. So this is where the system breaks down. This is, this is where when you understand what's going on in the theological seminaries and you hear that some of them are closing, you're like, praise the Lord, they all need to close, every single one of them, shut down, useless, because they're producing intellectual philosophers. So they got to go. And that's the type of level of reform. So for most people, if they hear that, they'll say, that's too radical. Well, that's that's why nothing is changing and it's getting worse. You're closing churches because these intellectual philosophers, they come in and they shut churches down. This is what they do. Notice verse 32. And Jeroboam ordained a feast on the eighth month and on the 15th day of the month, like unto the feast that is in Judah. And he offered upon the altar so did he in Bethel sacrifice unto the cow, unto the calves that he had made, and he placed Bethel the priest of the high places which he had made. So he's doing calf worship, as in Egypt. Because remember, he had he was in exile in Egypt, so he had learned the Egyptian method of calf worship. So he brought it back to Israel, and this is what it is. Remember. When you look at almost all these pastors, another major important thing, a lot of the pastors that are preaching nonsense in the church, uh, they went and got their PhD from uh, outside institutions. And they bring back the calf worship back into the church. If you ever study the story of somebody like a Desmond Ford, you look up it, on it online, you realize he, was thought, he, he, was, he had a PhD from... Uh, university in England, I can't remember, I think Manchester University. So whatever they taught him there in the PhD department, he came back and he started teaching that in the church. And at first people didn't recognize what he was teaching, that he was teaching uh, not a religion. So that's the problem. They always go and they go see the calf worship somewhere else and they bring it back into the church. So who is troubling the nation or the, the, the church? It's... That is the idea. You see the similar idea also in the nation. Notice as the nation moves in the wrong direction, uh, constantly in the news you see a report of the princes and the princesses and the kings and queens of Europe. Is that they want to go back to that oppressive way. Notice verse 33 says, So he offered upon the altar which he had made in Bethel on the 15th day of the month and he says, and it says here, even in the month which he had devised in his own heart, an ordained priest unto the children of Israel, and he offered upon the altar and burnt incense. So what's troubling the nation now? So this is where now to me, when you look at these things, you can, um, giving you a broader picture here now of what current events is. So when we look at the current events and what's currently going on, 
we can ask our quest, self a question. Because remember, the liberals, if you talk to a liberal, they say it's the conservative. It's the problem. If you talk to a conservative, they say it's the liberal is the problem. Now, I tell you that I believe both are the problem. Um, because both are living, uh, the lifestyle is crazy. You know, both, you know, both are living. Think about it. For a conservative, morality is anti-abortion. That's the only morality. If you're if you're conservative, you're moral. You're against abortion. That's it. So anything else that's going on that's wickedness is unimportant, because that's what makes you a Christian or moral. Is your anti-abortion? It's very simple. It's like a cookie cutter, and so you can go out there and strut your stuff and lift your chest up in the air and say, "Look, I'm better than the sodomites over there on the left, who are sodomizing each other because I'm anti-abortion." You see, that's it. That's the only morality. So that becomes a problem. So notice here, um, devil worship was always a part of what goes on. And as I've pointed out to you, the psychics, the psychic network have reported in the last so many years, last few years, they've reported an increase in activity. The various different secret society are doing drive to try to attract more young people to join their devil worshiping organization. This is what's happening. So we... And we see on the in, on the I was going to say the internet, but we see on the the major media that spiritualism is now part of the music and the movies and all these things. All this spirit spirit business is part of the major media um, inculcation of wickedness in the people, devil worship in the people. Then we notice also in the in the video games. This was always part of the video games, like you know, almost all video games. The lower level is very cute and very childish, and you 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 work into the lower levels of the video games, and as it gets upper, it becomes darker and more sinister. And to by the end of the video game, you're either fighting a dragon, which is representative of the devil, some snake, or some demon, or something like that. So that's when you get to the upper level, you're dragon slayer. Um, and then all the video games are just totally filled with all kind of devilment. Uh, I don't know how else to describe it. So this is something that we see will the Bible predict will be an increase because every time a nation fall into darkness, spiritualism becomes wild, becomes heavy. And you can see this in time of Christ when Christ came on the earth, the devils, he was casting out demons left, right and center. And I really believe that a lot of what we're talking about with mass murders are basically people being possessed with the devil. It don't mean that they're, they're not guilty of doing it because they've given over themselves to the devil. But I just believe this is what it is. And in some of the cases, some of the people came out and said the microwave told them to go kill people and they listened to the microwave or the dog told them to do it. So the, this might be anecdotal, but I really believe it's true. Um, another thing that's happening is every time a nation fell into wickedness, they would sacrifice kids. Today, the conservative would say, Look, they we're killing almost a million babies every year in the United States and in other countries, more in other countries. Um and and so I accept this because you know it's it, I'm I'm not might not be big on anti, you know, I don't believe in abortion and all that, but I do can see um where the arguments of the conservatives where they'll say Look, we're murdering all these kids because of life start. And most people, I think they say, most of my plurality of people believe that life starts at conception. And so all this abortion is going on. Many of the conservatives now, from the other hand now, we say, look, we're killing babies. But if you look historically, when a nation become a dark entity, one of the things that they'll do is sacrifice kids, biblically speaking. So if you think about Egypt, what was the number one sin of Egypt? It was they were killing the, the 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 boy child of the Hebrews. So many people say, "Oh, but how? Do, why would God kill their firstborn?" Remember, as as you know the story, if you read that story in Exodus, that story is fascinating for this one thought in my mind here, uh, according to my presentation. When you come to that story, again, this is a kind of a side note, but when you come to that story, but it's, it, you'll see it, it ties in. So when you come to the story, you find that at the time of the last plague, I think it was the flea, second to last plague, the, the Lord at that time, Pharaoh says, leave. 
you know get out I'm, you're good i'm just this is too much right so pharaoh like says you and pharaoh said to moses this is the part where you read if you put punch in your search and go to the section in exodus i think it's chapter 11 or 10 where Mo, pharaoh says to moses you will see my face no more and moses says you will see my face no more so they agree that they they're not just going to go away and sacrifice they're not they're, they're separating so this is where that that the story flip it goes from let my people go that they might sacrifice to get out i want to see your face no more pharaoh says and then god says to moses now i think in chapter 11 uh, somebody here god says to moses I have one more, I have one more, no, this is God now. I have one more thing I'm going to do to Pharaoh. We're going to do a sacrifice and the firstborn is going to die. And and, and you, you pause because it's like they, they're gone. Basically, first you, you go and then God says, well, I have one more thing I want to do. Because remember, they were murdering the kids of the Hebrews. And God says, I have one more thing. I have something I need to settle with Pharaoh. Because this thing is not right. So I just pointed out because all nations, that's all they always do. When Israel fell, one of the things they did is they started sacrificing the kids. It's the same thing. They started sacrificing to Melcom, Chemosh, to the gods of the Zidonians. They started sacrificing. This is something that always happens. So I want to keep that in mind. Um, because they say, who is troubling? Now, when this happened, this is one of the reasons why God says, I'm going to step in. Um, I'm a, I have something to settle with these people because they're not right. They're killing babies or they're killing kids. So keep that in mind. So when we ask the question, who's troubling the nation? Remember, both sides are doing it. When Israel fell, it didn't matter if you were in um, Israel or Judah, devil worship became a thing remember Solomon it started with Solomon really because the Solomon who started sacrificing the kids and it went from Solomon to to Jeroboam and to the kings in Israel so this is the problem and so God said I'm gonna curse the nation for this so keep that in mind um, another thing that is a trouble to the nation no matter what side you look at it biblically I'm talking where God becomes angry with the nation is abusing strangers. You notice if you go again to the, the conservative, they think it's right because who, how dare they come to our country? So they think, oh no, you can go now and imprison them, separate the children, children again um, from their parents. So they, they, they think it's wrong to murder the unborn, but they think it's right to take the kids from their parents and separate them and permanently separate some of these kids from their parents. They don't have a problem with that. And so God doesn't look at these things favorably. God will punish. God says, if you do this to foreigners, I'm going to do this to your kids. I'm going to kill the, the father primarily. And I'm going to make sure your kids grow up without fathers. And notice who is dying most is men. Most of the drug epidemic that we've seen is coming from the men are dying. And so their kids are being left fatherless so that they can think about it and say, you know, you remember when you were on the border and you were making these kids separate from their fathers and their mothers so that they don't have no parents? Well, now you're going to die and your kid's going to have no parent. Notice, um, abuse in the fatherless. That's the problem that we see. You know, people will always be jumping around and making all kind of nonsense about, well, you know, you have these, these mothers, these welfare queens in the ghetto and they shouldn't be supported. Well, wait a minute. I thought you say you, you, you love the, the, the child and you don't want no abortion. This is why this is so complicated because they're anti-abortion, but then they're they're pro abusing people that have no parents, no, and especially if they're blacks with no fathers. You know, a lot of the black guys were trained by whites to be studs in slave farms. So the blacks still have this bad habit of just going around, these black guys going around, impregnating these women and then leaving them and leaving the kids to grow up without no fathers. And so, who should be the number one person to support these kids? Should be the people who are conservative. So, you see, when this hypocrisy happened, God says, you know, I'm going to deal with you guys for this nonsense. This is wickedness. So, oppressing the poor is another problem uh, that nations always have to deal with. False imprisonment, sodomy. Notice here, the, 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 the left think it's love. Let's say Jesus never condemned sodomy. 
the Bible only have it a few times and Jesus taught us to love. As a matter of fact, ironically, I was reading this um, reverend and I'm reading it and I'm going through and there, you know, questions about, because uh, I was just looking at tough questions that people ask about religion. And then she was, uh, she at first I didn't know who I was reading. I just saw a reverend and kept read it, reading and it was on Huffington Post. And I'm going through it and it's just all this fluff. And then I say, what am I reading? Who is this? And I go back up and I'm like, oh, it's a Sarah. I didn't notice the name. It's, it's a female priestess. This is another thing we know when church got in trouble. They start talk this talk up this female priestess. And I'm like, haven't they read the Bible? The moment you start reading the Bible, you come to Genesis chapter 3. You understand why God says the man must be the head of the household. Uh, but yet they come to you and they talk all this female priestess stuff saying, you know, this is part of the curse of a nation. When the priest, the priestesses take over and start telling us all this type of emotional love, love, love. So anyhow, the sodomites is part of always a problem. You know, some of the most massive curse that came up in a nation was because of one of the sins was sodomy. But they said, no, that's not a big thing. Incest, adultery, not a major problem. That causes a lot in Micah chapter 1, if you read Micah chapter 4, sorry, verse 1 through 3, you realize real quickly that one of the curse upon a land is because of this adulterous problem. A lot of mass murders are caused by adultery. I think the majority of mass murders are caused because of adultery. Again, drug um, and alcohol become a curse of a nation, cause and effect. You do this and this will be the results. Some of these things have nothing to even to do with God. God is not responding per se. In the sense of it's not causing the people to, to trouble themselves. They're troubling themselves. Because somebody say, so God is punishing the sodomites? No. You know, you mix sperm and, and, and feces and you get some strange disease. That's not God's doing anything to nobody. Incest, same thing. These kids coming up with all kind of disability. Because their first cousins are getting impregnating each other. That's not God doing. Adultery. People get caught in adultery and get wiped out. That's not nothing to do with God. Drugs and alcohol. That's people wiping out their own self with all this fentanyl and all these different drugs. Notice a lot of this is cause and effect. It's just the, the So when the question asks, who is troubling the nation? The answer is the nation is troubling itself. Whether it be doing things, wickedness that God had to step in or whether they're doing it to themselves. You can't blame God for this. You can't blame as I say, somebody want to take all the drugs in the world and destroy their life. How you how, how you gonna blame foreigners for that? How you gonna blame anybody for that? That's somebody doing it to themselves. Same thing with overeating. We have a healthcare problem. We you know so many how many people you know have a knee replacement and hip replacement, and they're 100, 200 pounds overweight. They're just ripping out that knee, ripping out that that, that hip. He can't bear it. Whose fault is that? Who's troubling Israel? But if you preach it, somebody will say, oh, you're troubling Israel. Like, how am I troubling Israel? I'm just telling you the stats. You can go in the newspaper and read it. You know, f almost 40% obesity rate in the nation. And then some people are morbidly obese. And I don't think they break the scale at 600 pounds. I don't even know what you call that. You know, it's just, it's, it is, it is. Just, as I say, it's a whale of a person. So if you notice in Daniel, because for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to read all of Daniel. I want to read Daniel chapter 4, and I'm going to tell you the story. You know the story. This is a story that Ahab became a massive king. Ahab is viewed as the gold. The gold, you know, there's a statue that Daniel was shown in vision in Daniel chapter 2. And the statue head was gold. And the Lord says, the king Nebuchadnezzar is the not just the king of Babylon, is the king of kings. He is like God. He is so powerful, he is so wise, that even God refers to him as there's no king like you. And the only body that you can say about is God himself. There's no one like him. That's how he's referred to in the Bible. There's none like him in all the earth. But yeah, Nebuchadnezzar was viewed as a king of kings. But Nebuchadnezzar, um, that power and that ability that God gave him, he got to his head and he wasn't doing right. So the Bible predicted that through, through, his, through, a, through a dream, God gave a dream to him and then gave Daniel the interpretation that he was going to get cut down because of this pride. Because this is what people do. They start taking pride in national pride and they say, our greatness. You can hear people say it now in our society. They say, our greatness is because our military 
Our greatness is because of our ingenuity. Our greatness is because of the color of our skin. They don't say, no, our greatness is because of God, because they forget God. So God said, you forget me? You forget who built you and made you? You think it's because what? Okay, like what? So notice here in Daniel chapter 4, verse 26, it says, And whereas they commanded to leave the stump of the tree's roots, thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee, after thou shalt have known that the heaven do rule. So he didn't know that. These people don't know that. Where are, wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins, multiple, by righteousness. So start doing the right thing. Stop getting all big-headed. And thy iniquities by showing mercy to the poor. If it may be a lightning of thy tranquility, thy, thy peace. So you want peace? He says, look, you can start doing the right thing. And you can start breaking off your iniquity by showing mercy to the poor. Very simple instruction. And it's, the instruction is still, still the same today. Who is troubling the nation? People are sinning. Sin is the trouble. As I read earlier, sin is a reproach to any people. Righteousness is ex what exalt the nation. You do right, you bless. You do wrong, you curse. Very simple formula. It's very formali form formulaic. And you want to follow the formula. But people think, no. It, oh, it's, I'm blessed because of something else. What are you blessed for? You're blessed because you did the right thing. That's it. Uh, to close, I'm going to read here. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1 through um, to where I stopped, 21, I think, or 20 something. Notice it says here, and it came, uh, Deuteronomy 28, verse 1, and it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord shall set, that the, the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. This is particularly important to us. As we live in America, the nation that is set on high above all the nations that are upon the earth. Now, I know this was written to Israel, but you'll see that it fitly applies. And all these blessings shall come on, on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Notice, the nation, you know, even if you go to Europe, they'll say the nation that is most religious in the world is the United States of America. A very religious nation. It exports televangelists, export preachers. Even though there's so much wrong, there's still so much Bible. And it holds the preeminence, I believe, because of this. That in spite of all the craziness that goes on, in spite of the parades with the Sodomites, in spite of the um, drug use and all this other stuff, in spite of all the violence and the, the prison industrial complex and all that, still is the number one nation for preaching in the world. And yet, in spite of all that, God continued to best because of this. But notice the churches are closing. Notice the people are very antagonistic against religion. Notice in the church itself, the church is becoming a closed off entity to righteousness and preaching. And many people that preach the truth has to go independent. Because righteousness, slowly but surely, is not exalting the nation. And sin is becoming a reproach to the people because they don't want to hear the truth. Wow, I just saw the time. Quickly here, i um, not going to get to get through all this, but I'll just add in a few more. And these blessings shall come and overtake you. Blessed shall thou be in the city, and blessed shall thou be in the field. Blessed shall the fruit of thy body which is a problem now people can't have kids anymore, and the fruit of the ground and the fruit of thy cattle and the increase of thy kind and the flock of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket and thy store. Blessed shall thou be when thou comest in and blessed shall thou be when thou goest out. The Lord shall cause thine enemies to rise up against thee to be smitten before thy face. They shall come out against thee one way and flee before thee seven ways. The Lord shall command the blessings upon thee in thy storehouse and all that thy set thy hand to do. And he shall bless thee in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. And I'll pause there um, because of the sake of time. So again, you want to be blessed. No matter what happened in the nation, it doesn't matter what happened in the church. What happens is that you want the blessing. You do the right thing. Because for you, it's the same reality. 
Sin is a reproach to any people, but righteousness exalts the nation. If you want to be exalted, if you want to be blessed, if you want to receive these blessings that the Lord here promise, you do the right thing. You might not be able to affect the nation, but you can affect yourself. Remember, even though wickedness was going on in the nation of Israel, there was always the prophet and the prophets and always those who follow them. And the nation was cursed. But those who followed the prophet, they were established and they were blessed. And it, they always had a witness that righteousness exalt, sin puts down. You want to be put up? Do the right thing. Serve the Lord. And as I say, come before him in his presence with thanksgiving and singing and humble yourself before the Lord. Show more mercy to others. Bless others and you will be a blessing and you will be blessed. Let us pray. Our oh, Father, words in heaven, I thank you for the blessings of this day, the blessings of your word, and the blessings, dear Lord, that you give us to know Jesus, your Son. May you be with us, dear Lord, that we might continue to serve thee all the days of our lives. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for being with me here on Revive Reform Radio. Looking forward to talking to you again live tomorrow morning where we should talk about wisdom for living. Until then, I pray that you may continue to walk with the King. Mm -hmm.